Great to see everyone, um, DEF CON noobs. Keep drinking water, take care of yourself. Um, I'm Jason Healy, I was asked to moderate this fireside chat with the director of your United States, um, Officer of the National Cyber Director. So today we have um, Director Harry Coker who we're gonna be having a fireside chat with. My name is Jason Healy, I get asked to do this. Um, I've been on the DEF CON review board for about 10 years, so we're CFP and we review all of the talks that come through. I've also been at the White House twice, 2003, 2005, and also to help set up the, um, the office as the National Cyber Director. Um, so Harry's gonna come out, he's got some, um, uh, some initial remarks and then we'll just dive right into the comments. So um, he's got an amazing bio we're not gonna cover, but to, please do be checking it out. Um, and with that, Harry. Thanks, Jay. Sorry. <laughs> first things first. All right. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, healthy poor. Yeah. That's a healthy poor. You're right there. As I tell all the bar bartenders I uh, work with, pour it like you don't own it. So that's what I did. <laughs> but that uh, actually came from uh, the Military Cyber uh, Professional Association. So that is. Cyber bourbon. How many Shoot. bottles do you have? Um, I have somewhere around 70. Uh, bought a barrel. But on, on to why we're here, sorry. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Jay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And actually, it, it's my first time at DEF CON, as you, uh, you've noticed. Uh, but as a scotch drinker myself, I'm a bit uh, disappointed that all of my speeches don't start this way. Um, but perhaps this will be another tradition that we uh, bring forth at uh, ONCD. All right. <clears throat> Uh, looking forward to our conversation, Jay, uh, where we'll dig into memory safety, uh, BGP security, firmware vulnerability, and open source software, all of the nuanced and technical topics that make hacker summer camp such a draw, even in this new venue. Uh, but before we get into the hard problems that really define our work at the uh, White House Office of National Cyber Director, I want to say a few words about the importance of this community to our effort to make uh, our nation safer, uh, more secure, innovative, and prosperous. Uh, this is my first DEF CON, again, as you noticed, uh, by my baptism uh, by this bourbon. And actually, it shouldn't be a tradition just for first timers. Um, but. Well, I have been thoroughly impressed by the people, the presentations, and actually uh, some policy proposals that I've seen over the past couple of days. Uh, I cannot say that I'm surprised. Uh, from my early exposure to coding as a computer science graduate student, um, to my time collaborating with reverse engineers uh, uh, and colleagues in, in the intelligence community, to arriving at the White House, I've known how special uh, the security research community is. Special, but often misunderstood. Uh, as a society, we, we are predisposed to celebrate builders, uh, inventors, engineers, the titans of industry. All are lauded for what they've designed and constructed. So it can be quite jarring to hear about a culture where tinkering is turned, to, to break, turned toward breaking things, albeit to make them stronger where rather than synthesis and cohesion, we talk about decompiling code to find its weaknesses, where manipulating people in the form of social engineering is venerated as a way of finding the weak points in a system. And if there's one place in the world where these concepts are particularly foreign, it's Washington, D.C. <laughs> our elected officials and our civil servants swear an oath to protect and defend the Constitution, and it is far from intuitive uh, to how hacking could possibly be in that interest. I can see where they're coming from, uh, but my personal experiences urge me to challenge them to think a bit deeper. Uh, to understand that, for folks in this community, the desire to make things, to take things apart is rooted in the hope that they will be made stronger. Uh, to recognize that the internet decentralized, governed largely by a simple set of rules written decades ago, is a miracle of human ingenuity. And that miraculous, as it may be, the internet also needs protecting. That ethos of trying to make the internet a safer place is what makes this community so important and vital to our way of life. 
It's why it's so important for me to have made this pilgrimage out to the desert, along with so many of our cyber colleagues. And I've got good news for you. My voice is not alone in Washington. The chorus is growing. Jay, I know that when you were actually serving on the National Security Council staff decades ago, uh, you weren't even allowed to come to DEF CON. Today, not only are the feds here in force to learn and to celebrate the work of this community, we are recruiting. One of the key projects that we launched at the Office of the National Cyber Director uh, was a white paper focused on memory safety titled Back to the Building Blocks. I will admit to being a, a, a bit surprised to see such a technical product come out of the White House. Yet after reviewing the report and learning about the research and consultation underlying it, I was completely convinced that it was vital that the White House shine a spotlight on the need to adopt solutions on the most critical vulnerabilities. The White House endorsing formal methods is now a bit of a meme, and I could not be happier. These are outward signs of progress. At least as important, though, is a cultural change happening in Washington. For the first time, we are seeing policymakers consider how to leverage unique aspects of the security research community to solve some of the very hardest problems in cybersecurity. Some of that is manifesting at the operational level as collaboration, not simply information sharing. And that has been increasingly the norm at NSA's Cybersecurity Collaboration Center and CISA's Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. And it does extend to more strategic proposals, too. Just yesterday, ONCD and our partners in the government's open source software and security initiative released a report summarizing key findings from a request for information that we announced right here at last year's DEF CON. Importantly, that summary also describes actions uh, that we are taking in response to the feedback from this community. Some of those actions are inherently governmental. For instance, we are proud to announce that the Department of Homeland Security has committed $11 million from the bipartisan infrastructure law to launch the open source software prevalence initiative. Along with partners at our national labs, the initiative will assess the prevalence of open source software and operational technology used by critical infrastructure owners and operators. We know that open source underlies our digital infrastructure and it's vital that as a government we contribute back to the community as part of a broader infrastructure efforts. But many more of the recommendations go beyond what the government can do alone. And that's where you all come in. These policy proposals rely on the dedication of security researchers and their willingness to freely share their findings in order to work. In our conversations, we are developing a software liability regime too. Uh, we are increasingly aiming to leverage this unique community as part of novel policy solutions. Our reliance on all of you does, however, come with a commensurate increase in responsibility. In the President's National Cybersecurity Strategy, we call for more of the responsibility for defending cyberspace to fall upon the more capable actors in the ecosystem. That means technology producers, yes, and certainly the federal government, but it also means all of you. I know that you all are up to it. And I know that the same value set that drives responsible vulnerability disclosure will lead you to continue to step up for the protection of the internet. I know the internet is a safer place today because of all of your efforts. But I hope you can appreciate the magnitude and impact of the hard problems defending cyberspace. They may seem easy to some of you, but the president can't simply issue an order and solve those problems. We've known about vulnerabilities in the border gateway protocol for decades. Still, much of the U.S. internet traffic is subject to hijacking. Memory safe programming languages have similarly been around for years. Still, critical software that underlies our society is written in C simply because that's what's convenient. The tragedy of the commons around open source software development is a well understood phenomenon. Still, Vital, vital packages are maintained by tiny bands of volunteers operating 
on a less than shoestring budget. Policy can address some of these problems. Now, I'll even go further. Policy is essential to addressing these problems, but policy does require time. The people of the United States have entrusted their government with awesome responsibilities. And as we work to use them to improve our cybersecurity posture, we must ensure that we do so responsibly with an eye towards outcomes that preserve the innovation and decentralization that have made the internet the miracle that it is today. Most important, though, is that we continue to work together. At the core of our approach at the Office of the National Cyber Director is partnership. We prioritize hearing and learning from a diverse array of stakeholders, and you all are key constituents of ours. I know that Jay and I will dig into some of the details on various initiatives, but we will also continue to seek your feedback throughout the rest of this weekend and beyond. So thank you again for everything you're doing uh, every day to passionately protect our digital ecosystem. And thank you again for welcoming me to DEF CON. Um, okay, so to start with, um, Harry, be really careful about this table because because you sp the previous speakers are messy and there is booze all over this table and if we touch it, we're going to stick to it. So I would just be careful about that. Okay. Um, second, remember all those questions that we said we were going to talk about? I'm not going to start with those. I like that. Um, yeah, so the, the ONCD staff here is starting to panic a little bit. Because, because you said such, you know, a word that we don't use here at DEF CON often enough. The internet is a freaking miracle. Right? And, and I mean that in two ways, and I'm going to ask you to expand, but let me, let me go into it. And because and miracles are two things. Like, one, the internet is probably the most transformative technology since Gutenberg. Right? Since we came up with movable type, it has, the internet and the things around it have probably transformed us as a species more than anything else. And you know, just imagine if the Pope, the petty princes of Europe could have known what was being printed, who was printing it, and to whom it was being passed. Right? We wouldn't have had the Renaissance. Right? The internet is this real miracle that we often take advantage of. And it's a miracle in another sense too. Right? A lot of times a miracle is just something that is really, 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 really hard and still comes to be. And when I see this community, Right, I think and a, a lot of my colleagues in academia and others just take for granted that the internet is stable at large scale. Like, oh, it just works. And I'm like, no, doofus. Like, people are working weekends and they're missing kids' birthdays and they're missing every holiday for years to keep it running. Um, you know, Apollo 13, yay, nerds, right? It's one of our favorite movies, right? And what did those NASA engineers have to do to get n Apollo 13 running, right? They took all of their stuff and they had to completely nerd, how can we make this work? And like, y'all are Apollo 13-ing every week to keep the internet up and it just gets taken for granted and a lot of times it ticks me off. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for acknowledging and using that word that we don't enough. Well, um, thank you for mentioning that. The internet, everyone can keep the <laughs> It, it, it's unfortunate that uh, you know, miracles like that are taken for granted. I, I think if uh, we take the time to reflect on the impact of our daily lives uh, that the digital foundation has, uh, it won't be taken for granted. Uh, but we have become accustomed to a certain way of life and we expect things to always be there without looking behind the curtain and seeing those folks working. And, um, and this is, so let's dive in, let's start, Actually, can I see? Because you're wearing some bling. We're wearing some bling here, and there's a. You got this. Yeah, boy. <laughs> you want to talk about? Um, so I got one because I asked, and I used to work in the and I worked in the office. But can you talk about the the badge you have on top here? Yes. And, can, and how can people get them? Yeah, uh, the badge is the Office of National Cyber Director. Hopefully, you all got them last year, and hopefully, you'll get them this year. Um, and you ought to take a look at the open source software security report. Uh, that we issued yesterday. There are some clues there. Read it carefully. That's the first clue I'm giving you. Uh, you can also take a look at our GitHub um, uh, account to get additional clues. But they are, they are here and uh, available. 
And, and again, I'm, I'm just going to call some things out here, right? When I, when I was at White House, I started in 2003. I'd already been coming at that point to Black Hat for uh, um, DEF CON for a couple of years. And they wouldn't let me. And now there's a White House GitHub page, right? White House is doing official badges. You've probably got, how many folks do you have? You're probably at least 10 folks here. At least 10. Ten's a good number. Um, that, are, that, are, that are all over. And when you do something like this in the White House, like, this stuff starts to become a presidential record, right? I mean, this is, you can't imagine, like... Yeah. Well, I, I, I talked briefly about the culture change that's ongoing in Washington, and, and it's required. Uh, the things uh, that are happening around the world uh, require us to evolve uh, with them. You know, there are revolutions, but I think human nature is only that we can evolve. Uh, but we have to try to keep pace. Culture change takes a while. Uh, the White House and other government institutions recognize that we need to be able to relate more broadly, and that's part of the culture change. We need to be able to trust more broadly, that's part of the culture change. We need to be able to look at the community uh, research uh, effort and bring that in uh, to, to our, recognize uh, that it's part of our team. It's always been a part of our team, but we have not always recognized it. That's part of that culture change. And, and, and I love it because it's so much deeper relationship now. Um, yeah. On this stage, in this chair, uh, Jen Easterly yesterday, I don't know how many saw Director Easterly, and she was great, but she talked about when she was a, a more junior, and she was helping prepare Keith Alexander for when he was coming to Black Hat. And, and I know one of the leading hackers like had brought eggs with him and was gonna throw eggs and ended up mm -hmm. not, because this was right after Snowden, because it was a very fragile relationship then between the federal government and hackers. Yeah. And now, again, I'm, I'm, I remember one time I was in your office, I was in the, in, in the White House compound, and I turned a corner and there were all these blue hairs. Right, you had all of these hackers who were in their full blue, blue haired regalia, um, with their tattoos and their, and their stickers, and, and they were just there to review the national cybersecurity strategy and give their input. It yeah, and, and that's actually a part of a broader culture change, so excuse me for going off script. Um, we, we need to get past how people look yeah. and how they act, if they're committed to getting things done. Um, if they're committed to getting things done for the good of this nation, um, they, they ought to be on the team. And personally, I was uh, I was challenged when when I, uh, uh, a person I hold dearly came came home with a, a bandaid over the eye, and I'm like, oh, what happened? And I bumped my head at school. I'm like, okay. Then I saw the prom pictures, and it was a, a earring there. Uh, <laughs> but I had to get over that. That was my issue, yeah, yeah, yeah. not my loved one's issue. Yeah. And that's just. You know, a personal anecdote on, and it wasn't me, by the way, yeah. just to be clear. Uh, yeah. on, on getting getting past yeah. how yeah. people yeah. look, where they're from, how they talk. Yeah. If we're committed to accomplishing the same outcomes, let, let's move out together. So let's actually get to one of the questions that I said I was <laughs> that I said I was going to ask. If you insist, because um, we've had, you know, hackers in general, we hate these bullshit requirements, right? We hate these things that are that are put in the way. Because um, that's, what, that's what the community is about, is saying, wait a minute, that's security theater, this is bullshit, let's, you know, let's bypass these. And one of those that's held this community back, like so much of what we have to do is positive action. But sometimes what we have to do is just remove the bullshit. <laughs> and, and often we would have these educational and other requirements for jobs. Yeah. That, and this is tough for me to say as a university professor, ah, yeah. um, is, we would have these requirements for degrees that just weren't necessary. And, and I think we've made a lot of progress, right? We, we have, and, but first off on, uh, on the bullshit, yeah, yeah. You know, throw a flag. If you see something that's not right, yeah. throw a flag. Uh, we have thick skin at uh, ONCD. We know that no entity gets it right the first time, every time. So we want constructive feedback uh, nonstop. So bring that on. Um, you know, we're, we're want to do that. Yeah. Um, Skills-based hiring, it yeah. looks like we've been yeah. pulling out a lot of requirements. Yeah, and, and I, I share your um, challenge on, uh, on the four-year degree requirement. Uh, one, one of the tangible uh, outcomes that uh, our office has been able to accomplish uh, with our partners, and you'll hear me talk about with our partners a lot. Um, our, our office is about collaboration, 
um, leadership via collaboration. We stood up uh, to bring coherence to the federal uh, cybersecurity ecosystem, not to be in charge, but to lead. And you don't need to be in charge to lead. So we are leading via collaboration. And one, one area with our partners is a skills-based hiring approach. And we recognize that it had been emerging in the private sector and other functional areas. And given that there are roughly 500,000 open cyber jobs in this great nation, and that does not imply we're 500,000 people short in talent, we have the talent. Um, it's, not a, it's not a talent issue, it's a recruiting issue. Um, so we developed a national cyber workforce and education strategy to help address that $500,000 500, gap uh, in, in open cyber positions. And one, of, one of the um, uh, focuses is removing barriers to these good paying, purposeful cyber jobs. One of the barriers that we had seen is requirements for four year degrees. And I'd imagine that just about everybody in here knows folks that don't have four-year degrees that are making substantial contributions to cybersecurity. Uh, initially, when our team took that on, we thought that needed to change a law or needed to change a regulation. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, it was just a legacy bad practice. So the first step uh, that our team has taken on in concert with the Office of uh, Management and Budget, OMB and others, is to reach out to the departments and agencies, senior acquisition executives, to ensure that they know that they are not uh, being held to account by the federal government on this four-year college degree. Uh, if, if there is a requirement, it's a specific department and agency requirement, and it should not be there. Again, it's a legacy bad practice. So we're getting that word out on the federal contractor side. On the federal employee uh, government civil servant side, we're working with our partners at the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, uh, to do the same thing, to go towards skills-based hiring. Uh, why? Because it's not about the paper certification that we all frame and put up on our wall. It's about the knowledge that we have. It's about the skill set that we can apply uh, to the mission set. And uh, you know, the example that's most near and dear to me, I spent uh, several years at the National Security Agency working shoulder to shoulder with our colleagues at the U.S. Cyber Command. And many, many of the operators at NSA and Cyber Command are military members. And many of those military members do not have four-year college degrees, but they all have the skill set necessary to make significant contributions to our nation's security in cyberspace. So we're working with OPM. They've taken on the task to be completed by uh, June 2025 to transition the largest IT uh, occupation in the federal government, the 2210 series, to a skills-based approach. And that's just the right thing to do. Um, that's going to remove some barriers, that's going to close that gap, and it's going to make us safe. So, especially for folks that don't necessarily know how DC works, right? Um, I'll start with that. That would include story. me. <laughs> Right, when, when Harry talked about workforce, right, the very first workforce recommendations came from the White House um, in 2000. So President Clinton's administration had come out, it was the first, um, it wasn't quite a strategy, but it was, um, it was an implementation, and they said, boy, we've got to solve this, right? So it goes back to 2000, and it's not like DC was, the US government wasn't trying to do this, um, it's just that there are hard problems that needed longer than you could do in one administration and more than you could do. Because normally in the White House, like when I was there, we had maybe four or six people that were looking at um, cyberspace, especially on the defensive side. Um, right? Even now out of the National Security Council, there are maybe six or eight that are doing defense. And your team now is? 85-ish. 85-ish, right? So now, 
the National Cyber, the Office of the National Cyber Director can say, we're going to have a special team of a couple people led by an Assistant National Cyber Director to do workforce, and they're going to stay on the problem year after year and make sure we actually make a difference to stay with it. And because that's at the White House, oh, and some of her actually hired in as career civil servants as part of the White House, those jobs are on USA Jobs, <laughs> go, go look for them. Um, that they will be able to be there in between administrations. Because the director talked about hard problems. Now, in your, so workforce is one. You brought, you really featured open source and you just had this report came out yep. this week, right? Yes, yesterday? yesterday. Yep. Wow, great. Yep. Uh, you let in with hard problems. And that's one of the things that uh, the Office of the National Cyber Director is known for, um, addressing the hard problems. And what's a hard problem? Uh, you mentioned a workforce challenges uh, were brought to the forefront uh, during the administration of President Clinton a couple decades ago, something like that. Um, years and years, problems lingering uh, that have not been sufficiently addressed. Those are hard problems. Uh, that's what we like to take on. <coughs> the easy stuff we leave to, to other uh, entities and that's fine, they're valued. But it's the hard problems that we take on. Um, several of those hard problems, yes, include uh, open source software. How do we address the vulnerabilities how do we value uh, the folks that are keeping open source software uh, as safe as they have done? Um, the report uh, talks to uh, how some of our open source folks feel. I think the, the quote was um, unpaid hobbyists, uh, unpaid hobbyists. And, and that's, that's accurate in many senses, but it's not accurate when you couple unpaid with the impact that they have. Uh, we need to take a look at how to um, show our, uh, how much we value those folks. We value them, um, but we don't show it the way we should. So we need to take advantage of that. I know earlier today, uh, we, we talked about the German tech fund uh, that's in the report. Uh, that's that's a, an investment made by the German government on some of their software. Huh. And, and some of the recommendations uh, into the RFI were for the U.S. federal government to make some investments in the um, in, in soft, uh, open source software. Yeah. Can, can, I, can I take a point just right there? Certainly. You mentioned the RFI, right? So one of the ways the U.S. government works is by putting out, hey, we're, we're thinking about making a new rule or we're looking for new information. So ONCD has done two or three at least? At least, yep. Um, so they did one on, hey, we're inter what are your ideas on regulatory harmonization? Um, that got maybe 85-ish responses. What are your ideas on open source? So this came out, um, I think the responses were due in November. Uh, on open source, we actually announced that here last year. Oh, great. Oh, yeah, it was the last year. And, and actually, that, that's why we came back to announce it. Great. it. It's great to take all these actions. It's great to have RFIs to get input from the people who, frankly, may know yep. more about these yep. items than we do. Um, but it's not great if we don't take it on board yeah, and yeah, follow yeah. up with action. So yeah. we have the summary reports, yeah. and uh, there will be a public and private sector working group that stands up later this year to take on those recommendations on how to better protect open source software great. and demonstrate how much we value that. Yeah, great. Uh, just a quick question. Ha how many folks here have ever responded to one of these RFIs or, or the like? So we, all right, we've got a handful, but that's not a lot. So, so when you hear, if you say, man, the stuff that Washington DC is bullshit, they always get it wrong. Like look for those RFIs, right? Because that's, that's the government, like that's the White House, right? Going out and saying, what are we doing wrong? What can we do, do better? What are your ideas? And you can just submit, <laughs> right? You know, you don't have to be this tall to enter. You can submit your ideas directly on, on how we should be improving open source or regulatory harmonization or whatever the next one is going to be. Because now ONCD has made this a repeatable process. And, and I don't think NSC ever did this or OMB, right? I think this is a very much an ONCD thing, right? Other agencies are doing it now and we're, we are happy that they're doing it now. Again, the key is, uh, t to make it meaningful. Um, and I'll, I'll just speak frankly. Right. I, I have heard, we have heard uh, from our, our partners in the private sector that if we don't act upon the feedback, then the opportunity to contribute to an RFI uh, is not going to be nearly as meaningful. And to that end, Jay mentioned the RFI on regulatory harmonization. 
and we got a lot of feedback, a lot of valuable feedback, um, and it came in large part from 11 of the 16 critical infrastructure oh, right. sectors, yep. and that's great. But my concern is the other five critical infrastructure sectors did not submit input yeah. to that RFI. Um, just, just think about it, like critical infrastructure sectors, which are kind of by definition critical to this country, didn't a, did not submit on um, their thoughts. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's unfortunate. We're still reaching out to them. Judge, judge, yeah, judge. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're still reaching out to them because we value their input. Maybe there's another means that's uh, more convenient for them. Uh, so we're not giving up on them. <laughs> right. Good. But they passed on that opportunity, but we'll, we'll get with it. Yep. Yep. So one of the ways that you can connect, one of the ways you can make policy better, hopefully we might have time to talk about some other ones, um, but be on the lookout for those RFIs. Even if your company is not going to let you submit, you can still submit just as an individual um, or grab a bunch of friends. Um, okay, other hard problems. Um, what else are we working? I heard, I heard you talk about routing, which we hardly ever talk about. Yeah. Um, so it's glad to, it was glad to hear you bring it up. Yes, uh, our team is working again with our partners um, in the federal government to include CISA, uh, NIST, the NSA, and plenty of others on uh, securing the internet. As you all know, the internet was created decades ago, um, not envisioned to be what it is today, critical to the way each and every one of us and our loved ones live. Uh, it was not envisioned to be that, but that's where we are right now. Um, it was not built uh, to be as secure and safe and reliable as we need it to be. Yep. And as a former program manager, uh, I, I know how difficult it is to bolt these things on <laughs> after it's, the product has already been built. Nevertheless, that's not enough reason to not take it on. Yeah. So Good. our team, uh, again, working with our federal partners, is looking at Border Gateway Protocol, mm -hmm. protocol the means of transferring uh, bulk internet data, um, and how to secure that. Uh, what we are uh, working on is a, is a recommendation for RPKI uh, as a solution to that, and we realize that RPKI is not gonna solve all of the problems um, on, mm -hmm. on that yep. Border Gateway Protocol. But we also realize we need to start somewhere, sometime, and RPKI is, is a great place uh, to start. And um, we're still seeking input on, on how to address those challenges in BGP, and that's one of the reasons we're here, to seek you all's input on BGP. You know, and again, another hard problem. It's been around for years and years and years. Uh, we have known that the internet is not secure, uh, but we twiddled, twiddled our thumbs and, yeah. and said it's not secure, and we have not taken secure action, uh, sufficient action, but we're doing that now. Yeah. That's great. Uh, and two quick notes. Uh, two cents, secure by design, we've known for a while. Um, we have actually known for almost 52 years. So, hey, I'm a college professor by day, and so, right, I've got time to look at this. Um, October 1972, the Anderson Report came out and said security cannot be uh, included by retrofit, it has to be included by part of the design. So for since 1972 we've known that. The same report bas said basically the red team always gets through, meaning the offense has the advantage, right? The attackers are, are able to get through, right? So remember I talked about that miracle, right? We're 50 years into this. Our grandparents had this, these problems. Unless we can really tackle these hard problems, our grandkids are going to be suffering through the same stuff as we are. And that's kind of depressing, right? To think that they're like, our grandkids are going, Daddy, Daddy, we had a DNS issue today. Oh. Yeah. But, but that's our reality. Um, that, and that should be our impetus for action. Yep. And you talk about these decades old problems. Another one is memory safe programming, or mm -hmm. non memory safe programming languages. We, we've known it for years and years, uh, but we have been slow uh, to address it. And when I read our report that was released earlier this year, Building Blocks, please take a look at it, critique it, and let us know what you think. Um, I, was, I was surprised to learn that that problem has been around for so long. And then I was surprised to learn that the software developers, the community itself, knew about the problem and had been advocating yeah. <laughs> us to make that transition. 
But for whatever reason, and I'm not into blame, I'm into fixing okay. things, uh, but whatever reason, we didn't take action on that. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to do that now. Yeah. Um, along those lines, uh, college professor, <laughs> we, we need memory safe programming languages to be taught in good, colleges good, good. and high schools and trade schools and elsewhere. And I was at, uh, I'll say, A Service Academy, not yours or mine, um, <laughs> earlier this year, talking to a, a young person about um, that building blocks report. And I asked the individual if they had read that report and they had not. So I gave a high level, non-technical uh, synopsis of the report saying, you know, we need to go to memory safe programming languages. Here are some recommendations. Here are examples of non-memory safe programming languages. And when I ran down the list of non-memory safe programming languages, uh, that individual said, oh, but they're so convenient. <laughs> and I said, I exactly. But, you know, that's the challenge. Can't always choose convenience over safety and security and reliability. Then I asked the individual, well, when you do graduate and get your commission, what, um, what warfare specialty will you go into? And the response was cyber. And I said, well, in a few years, you'll understand better. <laughs> and, and that individual will. Yeah, I mean, I, it was a quote that I first heard from Dan Gear, probably in 2001 or 2002, of the enemy of security isn't insecurity, it's convenience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it just, Dan has been so right and so much. Uh, so, um, some of my friends who run CornCon um, out in Iowa had, had, they had, a, they had a project of looking at, um, we want to look at the textbooks to see if they're actually teaching good coding procedures. Like, not are we doing including cybersecurity in computer science programs, but are we teaching crap in computer science, like out of date stuff in the programs? And it seems like, you know, I mean, degrees are important. That's a lot of the ways that many of us do, do get in. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to raise that because it, it struck me as an important idea. Yes. Um, just yesterday, we visited the College of Southern Nevada and in our student roundtable, um, one of the students mentioned and several of the students um, endorsed uh, that, that student's perspective that the textbooks that they're using um, need to be more current. And, yeah. and that's valid. That's a challenge. You know, our field is evolving so rapidly, uh, but we need to figure out how to at least keep pace. It'd be better if we stayed yeah. ahead, but we need to figure out how to to keep pace with that. Yep. Um, By the way, um, I saw you dancing on the side of the stage. Yes, sir. Are you tracking the Olympics break dance competition? Oh my gosh, it's great. Yeah. All right. Um, go Team America. For those of you from America, if not, go whatever your country is. It's just amazing, especially because it's so right. Especially as 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 computer security professionals, it's really easy to get pessimistic about stuff. Right, every year things seem to kind of get worse, and it's nice, and it seems like everybody hates each other a little more each year. So I'm glad you brought it up because it is great to see what all the athletes are doing, especially um, yeah. when we're putting it together. But and, I don't, I, I didn't, I didn't make the yeah. team this year. And, and it goes back. Yeah, you know, had I not been here, I'd have been in Paris competing. Yeah. But, 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 but that does go back to our earlier um, conversation on cultural change. Plenty of people don't think that's a sport. Shouldn't be an Olympic sport, shouldn't have a gold medal. Uh, usually they have gray beards like me and you, okay. uh, but we need to evolve with, with our people. Yeah. Um, all right, so as we start closing out, uh, there's gonna be two questions, and one is, um, we've talked about some ways people can get involved. The RFIs come out, you can apply to the RFIs, right? The jobs at White House, right? You can go and you can apply to a job at the White House. Um, and like, they're amazing. <laughs> um, uh, how else, uh, so I've got a couple ideas, I'd love to hear your ideas on how this community in particular can get involved to help unfuck policy in Washington, D.C. Yeah, um, I'm big on, on, um, on mentoring uh, and sponsoring. And we've been on a, a tour of uh, colleges around the country. Uh, and what a consistent theme that we've heard from the students is they want to learn more from experienced people. I think there's opportunities for all of mm -hmm. us um, to, to mentor. Yep. I almost said these young people, but yep. fortunately there are some not so young people also 
changing their career focus into cybersecurity. So there's opportunities there. We are uh, partnering again with our, our federal department and agency uh, colleagues on hiring sprints across the country. Mm -hmm. um, if you all are hiring, you know, let us know. Right. Um, if you know folks looking for jobs, you know, send them in, in the direction of those hiring sprints. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of opportunities. And again, when you look at 500,000 open jobs, uh, we need wow. to do that. I, I want to call out a, a, a couple of um, folks here. Um, do we have any folks that teach cybersecurity? Please clap. All right, yeah, hands up. All right, for those that teach, uh, any, uh, any teach at the high school level or below? Um, good, only a couple, right? So, um, right, volunteering at the schools, doing what you can, seeing if you can put, right, um, I was just talking to a colleague at dinner the other day that was at um, uh, Montana, was it Montana State, um, and they didn't have cybersecurity, and he said, let's do this. Yeah. And they just got $14 million grants, and now they're plugging ahead, right? There's room for volunteering and to get things done. Um, so please get out and engage on that and mentoring the rest. I'd mention Tech Congress has amazing fellowships to help those on um, Congress to get better. Hackers on the Hill, if you're ever in DC, they've got great projects and the Policy Village here, it's incredible stuff. It is, and we need to, to increase it. Again, we need to, to take those numbers uh, down to something more reasonable. Um, you know, and again, back to the National Cyber Workforce and Education Strategy, create multiple pathways uh, and remove obstacles. Uh, one of the focuses there is we need to um, do better in recruiting. Uh, you and I talked earlier about uh, the numbers male versus female. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, how to uh, encourage more uh, participation from girls and ladies in cybersecurity. Uh, we, we were pleased yesterday at the College of Southern Nevada and UNLV. They both have women in cyber clubs. And to my delight, uh, they said the numbers were increasing. Right. Um, the the uh, productivity was increasing. And, and that's a, a good thing. Uh, we, we need to make opportunities available to every American, to every community across this country. A lot of that is exposing them to the opportunities. Yep. Oftentimes, people just don't know about cybersecurity and the good paying jobs, the meaningful careers, a way to help protect themselves, their nation, and their loved ones. And one other way I'll say you can, uh, you can participate, run for office, <laughs> right? You'll see Andrew running around with elect more hackers, whatever, however, um, we just need you, right? If you, if you think you can do better than those bozos, right? Let's let let's see in there, and I'm I'm serious, right? Through through um, DefCon over the last ten years, we've had a lot of great elected officials who were smart about computer security, but a lot of times they only learned about it once they were in office, and so we can do better. Okay, closing out our last couple of sips. Last question: favorite hacker movie or literature, and why? The um, <laughs> the uh, o the Oceans series, Oceans, oh. huh? Was good for me because it incorporated cyber into the team. And when I look back, Interesting. When I look back on my military experience and my uh, operational experience in the intelligence community, we did not always incorporate cyber early on in our, our missions. And we would have been uh, better served had we done that. So Oceans was a great uh, example of that. It, you know, and along those lines, when we talk to um, folks about the importance of cyber, um, every now and then, too often, we'll hear entities, individuals, and collectives talk about cyber being uh, an inconvenience. Um, and that's just so wrong. Today and tomorrow, and all the tomorrows that come after that, cyber is an imperative, not an inconvenience. Yeah. And so Oceans uh, yeah. got, got me focused on that, and I was Please, that they incorporated cyber into that to their Great missions. Movies. Great movies. All right, so we're going to leave with that, right? Because worrying about this and taking care of it is an imperative. Because we have been bequeathed a miracle, right? To finish off with with how Harry started off, right? Um, I always capitalize internet because to me it is a precious thing, and we're going to screw it up like we screw up everything else, like the air, land, sea. 
um, if we don't take care of it. And so I always capitalize internet just to remind ourselves, you know, we might not want to do that, um, that, <laughs> that this is only going to survive. Our grandkids are only going to have something as good as we have now if we fight to keep it so. So thank you. Keep the fight alive and have a great rest of your DEF CON. Thank you, Harry Coker.